Okay, moving into Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12. And I was telling Karen before class, chapters 10, 11, and 12 are about to kick my rear end. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's been an interesting challenge and an interesting study getting into these last three chapters, uh, but they're, they're very interesting. And you know, some may say that they're just laid out pretty, pretty easily, but they're not. And because they, there's events that are prophesied that have taken place, and which they're easy to, they're easy to look in, in back into history and say, man, that happened with accuracy. And then there's prophecy that goes to the end of time. And <clears throat> so I don't know how far we're gonna get tonight. Um, we'll for sure get through chapter 10. We may get started on chapter 11. I, I don't know, but they're all, um, uh, you know, I guess you could say it gets pretty deep, but then in other aspects, no, it, it, it doesn't, but it d depends on how you just look at things. But remember last week in chapter nine, you know, Daniel, he knew what was going on. He knew it was getting close to the end of the 70 years that they were uh, supposed to be uh, held in Babylon. And uh, <clears throat> so he knew that was coming. Um, and, but in Daniel chapter nine, he had that very strong heartfelt prayer uh, to God. And, you know, saying, you know, we know why we're here. We know what we did. We, you know, please uh, forgive us on this. And, um, and then we had, also Gabriel, the angel Gabriel that uh, entered or that talked to him uh, and uh, uh, about <clears throat> what was to happen. Um, so now we're in, we start chapter 10 of Daniel and it says in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel who was called Belshazzar. Its message was true and it concerned a great war. And the understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips. And I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. So as I mentioned, Daniel is about 84 years old at this time, and many of the exiles had already started, or I say many, some of the exiles had already started going back to Jerusalem. But there weren't that many that went back to, to Jerusalem, and you know, the question might be asked, well, why didn't Daniel go back? Well, as mentioned, Daniel was 84 years old. Daniel also held a high place in the government and so he may have felt that he could do more for the children of Israel remaining in Babylon than he would be going back to Jerusalem. But <clears throat> he, uh, he, it did, doesn't say he fasted for three weeks. He said, it says that he ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched his lips and I used no lotions at all until three work weeks were over. So he was, he was waiting upon this, uh, he was waiting up, upon God, not, eat, not eating anything uh, of, uh, you know, more or less just on a vegetarian type of diet, not drinking any wine. And on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Ufus around his waist. 
His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like a gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of the multitude. So this was like a supernatural man. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. Those who were with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So that's it's interesting that, you know, <clears throat> the, those that were around him, they did not see the vision, but they knew that something supernatural was there and they were scared and they fled. And, you know, it, it, it kind of reminds me of maybe, you know, whenever we're, whenever we might be somewhere and, you know, we feel the hair on our arms stand up and we, uh, we, we get scared, you know, it may come with, you know, when you hear lightning or thunder strike and the hair stands up on your arms. So I, I imagine, I don't know for sure, but I imagine that's kind of what these people felt at that time. So Daniel was left alone. But as he describes this man in linen, a belt with fine gold, <clears throat> this appearance is extremely similar to John's vision of Christ in Revelation chapter one. The appearance, and if you put uh, those, if you put Daniel and Revelation chapter one together, the, the parallel is very similar. In chapter, Revelation one, chapter 12, it begins, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands, was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was, like white, was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing water. So we, we find in Daniel chapter 10 and Revelation 1, parallel descriptions. And because of these parallel descriptions that are like this, many scholars affirm that this was uh, Jesus Christ. And this is, <clears throat> is also confirmed by the mind, in the mind of Daniel and the reactions that it had on Daniel. If we continue in verse eight, so I was left alone gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. So the effect of seeing this was pretty devastating on Daniel. He became weakened and he had no strength. In verse nine, then I heard him speaking and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. So this vision or what he saw just wiped him out. He fell down with his face on the ground and again, comparing over in Revelation, when he saw the vision of Christ, he fell on his face as, as if he were dead. And so the same effect on John as it had on Daniel here. <clears throat> A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. And then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people <coughs> in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. So Daniel is going to be told about what is to come in the future. <coughs> and it's... It's, uh, it's inconceivable that the Prince of Persia 
which many may many think is Satan, the power behind the earthly thrones. And remember when Jesus said to, or Satan said to Jesus, all of the kingdoms of the earth belong to me, they are mine, I can give them to whomever I will. And so even as in Ezekiel, the king of Tyrus, Satan is addressed through the king of Tyrus, and Satan is referred to through the prince of Persia. <clears throat> For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against these principalities and powers, these evil spirits, in it, these evil spirit entities that are working in the high places of the world governments. So Satan wants to suck us all into evil. And <clears throat> but sometimes I think Satan is more interested in world leaders over which he can influence many by the laws and edicts that the world rulers uh, enact. <clears throat> But it, I find it also interesting here that <clears throat> uh, for 21 days he was, he was restrained, the angel was restrained for 21 days until Michael, the great prince, came and set him free. And <clears throat> in studies of the Bible, Michael is always fighting with Satan, it seems, and, he, and he's quite a match for him. They were, if back in uh, Genesis, remember they were disputing with each other over the body of Moses. The book of Jude, Michael was disputing with Satan. Uh, I mean, in Jude, he was disputing over the body of Moses. Michael didn't bring any accusations against him. In uh, Revelation, he said, the Lord rebuked thee. And in the last final battle of uh, <clears throat> Michael, uh, the great prince will stand up against Satan and fight against him and his armies. So this, this battle's always been going on between Michael and Satan. And so here this angel was held captive until Michael came and delivered him. So like it was something going on up in the heavens where this fight was going on. <clears throat> Those who interpret the vision to be of Christ, we see in verse 10, a change of uh, personages or the number of people where he declares, and behold, a, a hand touched me. So we would assume in reading this <clears throat> that the hand was the one that he saw. But there's the other interpretation of the one that he saw as Christ say that it was Christ because in chapter 12 as we'll get to later on one of the others when he's declaring about the great tribulation he said how long until the he asked how long till the end of these things and so there was conversation that was going on between the messenger messengers but we'll get into that in chapter 12 <coughs> but Daniel is is now being given the understanding of the things that are going to take place toward the end so here we start in verse 15. While he was saying this to me, I bowed with my face toward the ground and was speechless. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I feel very weak. So here it seems like there are other persons here. Daniel's wiped out, the visions are wiped out, wiped him out, <clears throat> and he's kind of saying, I'm beaten, I've had it. And sometimes we kind of feel that way. We get pretty overwhelmed. Verse 17, how can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone, and I can hardly breathe. This also is comparison, uh, comparing or comparable to Revelations 1, verse 15 and following, where it says, John fell at his feet as dead, and so he describes, I had no strength, there was no breath, I was wiped out. <clears throat> Verse 18, continuing, again the one who looked like a man, so here, again, several persons, because one looked like a man, again the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, you who are highly esteemed. <clears throat> he said, peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, 
Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. So he said, Do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. So the prince of Persia is going to be replaced by the prince of Greece. But first I tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. So he begins to reveal to Daniel these things that are going to transpire as far as the future is concerned. And, and Daniel gets interesting details that many of, the, many of the Bible critics have a difficult time with chapter 11 that we're getting ready to get into the book of Daniel. They say, or some say, that it was actually written at 160, around 166 B.C., after all of these events take place. <clears throat> because it was impossible that these events could have happened um, without, but because of the detail that it could have happened without it have, have had already happened. And, uh, <clears throat> but when you look at the oldest translation of the, of the Hebrew Bible in Greek, which was made about 220 to two, uh, about 220 B.C., the book of Daniel has already included that, included in that. And it was accepted as being authentic at that time. So <clears throat> at least 60 years before these critics say the book of Daniel was written. So it's interesting that they could have had copies of this 60 years earlier before it was written and translated into Greek. So, <clears throat> but let's go into chapter 11. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. Now then, I tell you the truth. Three more kings will arise in Persia, and then a fourth, who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. So Darius was king at the time. And the three kings that follow where it says three more kings will arise in Persia and then a fourth. The three kings that follow are Ahasuerus, Artaxerus, and Darius. And, <clears throat> uh, and so these three kings will rise up and the fourth will be richer. And this history shows that this was Xerxes. The, uh, and he was stronger than all of them by his strength and through his riches and he stir, will stir up Greece. Xerxes was very wealthy, he was very powerful, and he made an expedition against Greece, but he was not able to, to defeat, not yet, uh, Greece. And so that particular part was fulfilled. <coughs> but then Greece will arise. Then a mighty king will arise, who history tells us this is Alexander the Great, who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. After he has arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be <coughs> excuse me, uprooted and given to others. So Alexander the Great will rise up, but when he falls, the kingdom doesn't go to his family. It doesn't go to royal lineage. It's, uh, it, it doesn't go to his dominion whatsoever. And uh, it ends up going, and we'll read this, uh, or history says that it went to four of his generals. <coughs> he had four generals, and it ended up going to those four generals. The king of the south will become strong. This is verse 5. But one of the commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. So the king of the south was General Ptolemy, who took over in Egypt. And General Seleucus took over in Syria. And then there was also another general who took over in Greece, and another one who took over in Thracia. So Greece was divided into four dominions. But he speaks now, <clears throat> and he doesn't bring up the Grecian or the Thracian kingdom, but only the Syrian and the Egyptian kingdom. 
And that's because they're the ones that really relate to Israel through all of this. For <clears throat> in their wars, their, Israel was the middle ground between Syria and Egypt. And, they're in, and the infighting that they had, they had to pass through, through Israel. <clears throat> Going on, it says, after some years they will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance, but she will not retain her power. And he and his powers will not last. In those days she will be betrayed together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. So what happened here is the king of Egypt gave his daughter Bernice to the king of the north who divorced his wife in order to marry Bernice. But when Ptolemy died, then he got rid of Bernice and took his wife back again, who in turn poisoned him. And she killed Bernice and her son. So when Bernice had a son, the former queen, her sons were exed out according to the agreement that they had. And she poisoned her husband and killed Bernice and her sons. And then, uh, then of course, her sons were in line again for the throne. And so Daniel tells everything else that's going to happen that take place. And when the brother Bernice gathered together an army of Egypt and came up and destroyed his wife who had poisoned her husband and had killed his sister, and that's <clears throat> actually is referring to, a, uh, and, and he that is begotten of her, which is referring to a family member, which was her brother, and he strengthened her in these times. So in verse seven, we read this, one from her family line, which is her brother, will arise to take her place. He will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter his fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. <clears throat> He will also seize their gods, their metal images, and their va valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off to Egypt. For some years, he will leave the king of the north alone. Then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south, but retreat to his own country. His sons will prepare for war and assemble a great army, which will sweep on like an irresistible flood and carry the battle as far as his fortress. So <clears throat> that is his sons, the king of the north, who is defeated by Eurigetes, and he assembles a great force, and one shall certainly come and overflow the land and pass through. So then the king, in verse 11, then the king of the south will march out in a rage and fight against the king of the north, who will raise a large army, but it will be defeated. And when the army is carried off, the king of the south will be filled with pride and will slaughter many thousands, yet they will not remain triumphant. So <clears throat> this is um, um, Philopater, in, history tells us this is Philopater, who's Ptolemy Philopater, who was the king of the south at the time. And he gathered together a great army they came against the king of the north. However, though, he defeated him and he took a lot of, of the treasures and stuff, but he did not take full advantage nor take control of the people. He was too interested in the immoral life that he was living back over in Egypt. And so it says here, he will slaughter many thousands. He did destroy a lot of the army, but he was not triumphant. He didn't take advantage of what he could have at the time. He just went back in, to Egypt and continued living his life of luxury there. So <clears throat> in verse 13, for the king of the north will muster another army larger than the first, and af after several years, he will advance with a huge army fully equipped. In those times, many will rise against the king of the south. Those who are violent among your own people will rebel in fulfillment of the vision but without success. So the king of the north came back again, which was Antiochus Megas, known as Antiochus the Great, but many will rebel. So Philip of Macedon joined with him against Egypt at this point <coughs> uh, in Egypt, plus some of the Jews who were also called. 
Verse 14, or then the king of the north will come and build up siege ramps and will capture a fortified city. But then the forces of the south will be powerless to resist. Even their best troops will not have the strength to stand. The invader will do as he pleases. No one will be able to stand against him. He will establish himself in the beautiful land and will have the power to destroy it. He will determine to come with the might of his entire kingdom and will make an alliance with the king of the south. And he will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom. But his plans will not succeed or help him. So now Urugetis is the king of, in, of the south in Egypt. And when he took over, he was actually just seven years old. <clears throat> and he was, you know, just a, a figurehead. Kind of like we have now in Washington. You know, we have a figurehead. He was just a figurehead. But Antiochus the Great took his daughter, Cleopatra, and, and made a deal that she would marry Eurgetes. Figuring that when she got there in the kingdom of Egypt, she would be there for her father. But when the marriage later was made and Cleopatra came, became the wife of Eurgetes, rather than siding with her father, Antiochus the Great, she sided with her own husband against her father. So the plan backfired. So Daniel tells about the plan and how it will backfire. If he had you know, only read the Bible back then, you know, he would have known better than send his daughter down there. So <clears throat> in verse 18, then he will return his attention to the coastland. So he was not able to conquer uh, Egypt. So he turned and st started home. And he got together a navy of 300 ships and he began to travel into the Mediterranean, beginning, beginning to actually fight against Rome, which Rome was beginning to be a power in the ancient world. So in 18, uh, verse 18, he will turn his attention to the coastlands and he will take many of them, but a commander will put an end to his insolence and he will turn his insolence back on him. After this, he will turn back towards the fortresses of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. His successor, Seleucus, will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. And in a few years, however, he will be destroyed, yet not in anger or in battle. So what <clears throat> happened is he was defeated by the Romans. And they determined that they would charge him or tax him for all these wars. And so he was given a tax that he had to pay every year. And and he and his men went into the temple to take away the treasures of the people, and they got ticked off, uh, as we do our tax collectors, uh, but they killed him, and he was poisoned and killed. <clears throat> he will be succeeded by a contemptible person. So what does that mean? What, that means one who lacks respect, he's miserable, he's low down, of no value. He will be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty, and he will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure, and he will seize it through intrigue. In other words, through a plot or an underhanded scheme, he's going to, uh, he's going to uh, seize it. So this was uh, Antiochus uh, Epiphanes, who was a, a real treacherous person. Then an overwhelming army will be swept away before him. Both it and a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. After coming to an agreement with him, he will act deceitfully, and with only a few people, he will rise to power. When the richest provinces feel secure, he will invade them, and he will achieve what neither his fathers nor his forefathers did. He will distribute plunder, loot, and wealth among his followers. He will plot the overthrow of fortresses, but only for a time. So he began to conquer, he did what his fathers uh, did not do, <clears throat> they, am they amassed wealth for themselves. He began to give all the way the money and stuff to the generals uh, that were with him. <clears throat> and so the practice of distributing that money to his generals and stuff was predicted here in Daniel. He would distribute plunder, loot, and wealth among his followers. With a large army, he will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south. The king of the south will wage war with a large and very powerful army, but he will not be able to stand 
because of the plots devised against him. So he comes against Egypt with a tremendous army and Egypt, Egypt, Egypt met him, but he began to defeat the Egyptians. Those, 26, those who eat from the king's provisions will try to destroy him. His army will be swept away and many will fall in battle. The two kings with their hearts bent on evil will sit at the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail, <clears throat> because an end will still come at the appointed time. So these people are gonna try, these, they're, these two kings are gonna get together. They're gonna talk about everything. They're gonna try to negotiate. They're gonna lie to each other about, yeah, we'll do this and you do that. And you know, here again, kind of like what goes on now, but <clears throat> they're going to sit there and lie to each other but it doesn't make any difference what they say, what they do. God's in control. He, the end will still come at the appointed time. So <clears throat> here they were stopped. Uh, history tells us that they were stopped by the Roman government. And you read the history. It's kind of interesting. The king of Egypt, his brother was in Alexandria. And both of them were doing a lot of lying and cunning. And so the king's heart uh, led them to mischief. And they... Uh, so they sat at the same table and they lied to each other, uh, making treaties which neither of them in intended to honor. The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. He will take action against it <coughs> and then return to his own country. At the appointed time, he will invade the south again, but this time the outcome will be different than what it was before. So once again, he's going, to, he's going to invade Egypt, but this time the outcome's going to be different. Ships of the western coastlands will oppose him and he will lose heart. Then he will turn back and vent his fury against the holy covenant and he will return and show favor to those who forsake the holy covenant. Uh, covenant. So <clears throat> when this time came, He came to this time in Alexandria. The Roman ships were in that port. And the Roman general, uh, Populus Lanus, came to him and said, the, Ro the Roman Senate has ordered you to go home with your troops. And he, uh, and this is what history says, and he said, I'll consult with my men and then I'll send an answer to Rome. And the Roman general took a, Cain and he drew a circle in the sand around him and he said you make your decision of whether you're going to surrender or not before you leave the circle and so he was pretty intimidated by that and he said I've decided to go home tell the Roman Senate so and <clears throat> so here again this was all predicted here of what we've read here in Daniel because the Roman Navy met him they were waiting in the port and all went as predicted. And you know, it's amazing that God would speak all of this detail uh, about this to Daniel when it had not yet even transpired. <clears throat> but the king, he was angry. He was really ticked off because of this. He had gone up there to fight a war. It didn't go as planned. He really kind of got embarrassed about it. And so, he had to pass through. Remember I said we had the king on the north, king on the south, and Jerusalem was in the middle. And so that was always kind of the neutral land, you could say. But he decided that as he went back this time, that he was going to desecrate the temple in Jerusalem. And he built an altar, a pagan altar, above the altar of God. And he even offered a pig upon the altar to an idol that had been set up there in the temple of God. In verse 32, with flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. <clears throat> so his desecration of the temple at this time, you know, it upset the people of, of uh, Jerusalem and Judas Maccabeus gathered together a group of zealots and they began to attack the Syrians and they defeated all the Syrian contingency that was against them. And they retook the temple 
They purified the temple. And <clears throat> this is what was known and still repeated in history as the Feast of the Dedication or Hanukkah in the Jewish calendar to celebrate the retaking and rededicating of the temple to God. <clears throat> Those who are wise will instruct many, verse 33, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. And both Judas and his brothers, uh, Judas Maccabeus and his brothers were slain by the sword. When they fall, they will receive a little help <clears throat> and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will come at the appointed time. So here at this point, the prophecy goes out to the end of, uh, of time, what we're going to see now. <clears throat> because this is, this is everything that we've said right here. You can go back into history and you can see it happened as it said that it was going to happen. <clears throat> so the next bit is, uh, is the prophecy that goes out to the end of time where we have the beast, the man of sin, the antichrist. <clears throat> and it says the king or the man of sin and the beast will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his ancestors or for the one desired or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above all. So <clears throat> Now this regarding, um, you look at this and it says, he will show no regard for the gods of his ancestors or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above all. So you think about this, he will show no regard for the gods of his ancestors. So will this be a Jewish individual? We don't know. It talks about the gods of his ancestors <clears throat> or one desired by women. <clears throat> and that can have a couple of meanings uh, on that because, you know, it was the desire back then, you know, it, the Messiah was going to be come of a woman. And so back then, before Jesus came, the, the, it was the desire of all the Jewish girls to be the privileged one that the Messiah that would bear the Messiah <clears throat> but they, they all wanted to be the mother of the Messiah but we all know that Mary was the one that God chose <clears throat> nor will he regard any God but will exalt himself above all and uh, one other thing there are actually some there's actually some buffoons out there who take this verse. Um, he will regard the God, he have no regard for the gods of his ancestors or the, for the one desired by women. And there's actually some out there that say that this man of the beast, the man of sin, the antichrist is gonna be a homosexual. So I'll let them, I'll say a prayer for them and let them be their buffoons. But instead of them, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his ancestors. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. So that sounds pretty materialistically to, uh, materialistic to me. You know, we look at today how men honor a god of forces or power, and that's what this person is. He's going to, he's not going to, honor gods of gods, he's going to want to, uh, or God, he's going to want to honor power, and that's what he's want. He will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign god and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. <clears throat> at the time of the end, uh, the king of the south will engage him in battle 
and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, which is Jordan, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. <clears throat> so Jordan will not be taken by the man of sin, the beast, the Antichrist, although Israel will. And it's interesting because Jews will actually be fleeing uh, for the protection to Jordan at this point. So Edom or Jordan escapes. However, he moves to eight, towards Egypt in verse 42. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. So he takes the land of Egypt. He will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt with the Libyans and Cushites in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him and he will set out in great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. <clears throat> The beast or the Antichrist here talks that he's going to enter the promised land. He's going to defeat many here in the last half of the tribulation. The beast will attack Egypt and succeed in conquering her. The beast will plunder the treasures of Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia. Uh, <clears throat> the Hebrew for Libyans is, is Cushites. Uh, Libya was to the west of Egypt and Ethiopia to the south. And it, you know, rumors of armies from the east and north are going to trouble him and cause him to return to Jerusalem. Um, the seas mentioned here are Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea. And the holy mountain is, is uh, Mount Moriah in Jew Jerusalem. And it's here that, he, that the beast meets his defeat as we read in Revelations 19, 19 through 20. And it's spoken about in Zechariah 14, 1 through 4. So God is sovereign over all of history from beginning to end. Nothing escapes him. Nothing gains dominance over his will. The Gentile world powers have their designs, but God has his design. God has the final soul, uh, say so. And there, <clears throat> as we read in Romans eleven twenty six, 26, there will come a time when all of Israel will be saved. God tolerates the atrocities of the beast, Antichrist, for a period, but he will determine the end of the, of the Antichrist. God's sovereignty <coughs> is, can be comforting to us because, like I said, he is in control. <coughs> Daniel, um, looking at, at this, Daniel, he devoted time to prayer and reflection to receipt to get spirituality he recognizes that not all struggles are merely physical or visible but there can be spiritual dimensions to all our challenges he stood grounded in his faith and value he trusted god and he recognized he continued to recognize the unique role that is israel uh plays in uh, in, in God's plan. So we all have to stay vigilant. We all have to be prepared. Uh, and even those that align with the biblical prophecy. All right, so we have one more chapter, chapter 12. I may do kind of a, uh, I may, and, and read, it's eight o'clock, but read if you have a chance the book of uh, the final chapter. Um, because this continues the vision. This, this vision is continued all through 11 and, 11 and 12 and gets into uh, more of the end times. But we'll <clears throat> go over that next week, uh, two weeks, okay? Next week is the third Wednesday. But let's, let's close the prayer. Father in heaven, uh, thank you so much for the book of Daniel. And Father, we seek to understand it. We seek to understand the visions that were given to Daniel. Father, we have the, the benefit of being able to 